Friday, May 7th, Adrian Burke. Laura thinks I can't see that she walks all over me in eggshells all the time, but I do see it. I see every moment of her nervous, lonely sadness. I see it, and I understand it. We were watching TV last night, and I must have squinted. I'm still getting used to the change in my vision. And besides, they talk so damn fast on TV. I can't keep up with them. Laura was sitting to my right on my blind side, so I guess she figured I wouldn't notice that most of the time she's looking at me, staring, really, with heartache in her eyes. But I could see her. The TV was showing me her reflection, like she was a stranger or something. I didn't say anything. I didn't want to know what she saw. And I'm not going to say anything to her about it now either, because then she'll just start pretending to be happy all the time. She has a right to be sad. She's lost a lot, too. She's a widow, don't you know? It rained this morning and I couldn't go for a walk. That's a shame. It's one of the highlights of my day. Honestly, I'm feeling pretty good already, getting my strength back. Yesterday, I walked over a quarter mile before I had to turn back. Needed to rest after that. Today, I was going to try to run half. It won't always be like this, Laura. I promise you this. I don't care how hard I have to exert myself or how much it hurts to walk towards my goal. I will be me again. Someday I can walk all the way to Castlewood if I want to. Wednesday, May 12th. Laura Burke. Adrian hunches over the packet the doctors gave him and counts on his fingers. He counts to four, pauses, and curses. Clenching his fist, he starts over. The second time he manages to get to five, but everything falls off when he tries to move his hand from one to the other. For a long time, he stares at his hands, flexing and unbending them, studying his knuckles. Then he starts all over again. Honey, I say, why not let it rest? The doctor said you should try to give it 40 minutes a day, and it's been two hours. Right now, I'm going to have to step it up if I want to be anything other than a salesman at Walmart for the rest of my life. If I want to get off this damn medication at all, so that's what it's all about. The medication. I put a hand on his shoulder. Exercising too much won't do you any good. You'll overwork yourself. Good. He looks up and smiles at me. I still get a little teary every time I see my husband's new face. If I put my best foot forward, I'll start to develop stamina, right? Maybe? I don't smile back. I study the way he looks now trying to find as many traces of his natural appearance as possible. I find quite a few places on his face that still look the way they used to. I fix my gaze on one of these safe places, and for a moment I see my husband as he used to be. Most of the details are still in place. Only the big picture has changed. Okay, he sighs, closing his workbook. What would you rather be doing? I shrug. There's an art exhibit on the sidewalk at an outdoor mall. We could check it out. Sure, he winks at me and gets up to get ready. Don't forget to bring a pill pack. He doesn't answer, but I know he'll bring it. Adrian desperately wants to get rid of those pills. They're affecting his ability to... to work. In fact, we haven't had sex once since I've been away on a business trip. It's really bothering him. I guess he sees it as an insult to his manhood. Men are so stupid about these things. No, no, no. He called the doctor on Monday and told him about the problem, but I guess they are hesitant to change the medication so early. Mood meds are a tricky game, and when they find something that works for them, they become very immobile about it. We just have to stay in touch with them, wait a little while and see how it goes. It's easy for them to talk. I can hear his voice from the hallway. It's a little slurred, but he's gotten much better with it. Honey, he calls out, where did I put my shoes? I smile to myself, but the smile doesn't last long. You put them on, honey, I reply. There is silence in response. Then something hits the wall hard. I run. Adrian? I call out, getting no response. Adrian? I run into the bedroom and see him sitting on the floor, staring at the wall. There's a gaping hole in it where his foot went in. Are you okay? I ask, but he doesn't answer. He doesn't even look at me. 
he's embarrassed. Even with the medication, these mood swings that the car accident has put in my sweet man's head scare me. I crouch down, cradle him in my arms, and hope it's not forever. Monday, May 17th. Melinda Blake. Hey, buddy. The last time I saw you, I thought you had lost a ton of weight, but I see I was wrong. You must be eating like a king. Rodney shakes Adrian's hand, laughing, and Laura gives me a welcoming hug. It's been a long time, she says. Yeah, Adrian says. I'm even a little hurt that you didn't stop by my hospital. He smiles, just teasing us, but his smile fades when he notices we're not smiling back. Did I miss something? He asks. Adrian, Laura says softly. Rod and Melinda came over three times. You and Rod were watching some superhero movie together when they came the second time. Oh, he frowns. Was I still in a coma? No, honey. You were conscious. You can't watch a movie in a coma. I think you spent an hour talking sports with Rod last time, too. He looks embarrassed. Sorry. He looks away. I don't remember much about the hospital stay. Well, that's too bad, Rodney laughs, because you got a phone number from a gorgeous nurse who looked fresh out of college. Rodney, I glare at him. I swear, sometimes that man can be so inappropriate. I won't pretend I don't wonder why I put up with him, but I'm guessing most women wonder that about their men. It's true. Rodney smiles. I'm just in love with you, I swear slipped a number in your hand and winked and just walked out of the room. And let me tell you, Aid, I really think he was your type. Adrian punches him in the arm and we all laugh. Anyway, I say, we would have stayed up further, but Laura didn't tell us about the accident until three weeks after it happened. We honestly just thought you two had stopped returning our calls. Rodney snorted. What she meant was that she thought it was as if your wife wouldn't let you communicate with me anymore. Really? For three weeks? Adrian cast a glance at Laura, who seemed suddenly very interested in what she had prepared for us in the kitchen. It's been a pretty emotional time, Adrian, I say softly. Somehow I doubt that we were a priority. You know? She was probably too busy worrying about you. But something about the way Laura looks at me instead of him stays with me. Speaking of priorities, Rodney says, what are we having for dinner? Give me five minutes and I'll show you. Laura takes the opportunity and hurries away. Neither man seems to notice her eagerness to leave. What a strange start to the evening. I'm going to go see if I can help her, I say, excusing myself. Behind me, I hear Rodney sigh. Oh, thank God. They're gone. The two of them giggle at that and then go outside. Right, I think like you'll ever make it without us. Laura is stirring something in a pot and looks a lot more tired than she did a few seconds ago. She looks up when I walk in, but remains silent. Is everything okay? I ask. Yeah, it'll be ready soon. I cast a glance at her, but she pretends not to read it. She knows full well I didn't mean the food. Okay, girl, I know how to play this game too, even better than you. Adrian seems to be doing well, I say. She shrugs, like she's trying to chase an insect off her arm. He's doing better than they thought, she admits. But he's overzealous. He seems intent on pushing himself to the point of exhaustion. Uh-huh. I pretend to study the contents of the pot. You, on the other hand, look pretty tense. I'd say you look more exhausted than he does. Really? Must be the cooking. He smiles forcedly. I've hardly been doing it the last few months. I was worried I'd lost my touch. Something in her gaze is about to break. I return her forced smile in the same way I received it. It's time to break down that wall. Laura, if you need someone to talk to, know that I'm here for you. Her face contorts and she sobs. I'm pregnant, she cries. Oh my God, Mel, I'm pregnant. What am I going to do? Now that it's out, she sort of leans on the counter, putting her hand to her forehead. Along the way, she grazes the stirring spoon and smears the bean sauce over her right eyebrow. 
A tear drips onto the counter, but she looks a little relieved that she finally said it out loud. I cast a glance down the hallway. The men are still gone. Good. They tend to ruin moments like this. I sympathize and congratulate her in equal measure, saying, Oh my God, what a year you're having, and pull her to me for a hug. Then I pull back and look at her. Adrian doesn't know yet, does he? She shakes her head. I can't tell him. I can't. Well, maybe not yet. But soon, I think. How far along are you? I grab a napkin and wipe the bean gruel off her forehead, playing mother to mother. I... I think about ten weeks. So you'll show up any day now. I'm surprised you haven't shown yet. I ignore the fact that her loose pants and top suddenly stand out in a new light. You're going to have to tell him something. I snip the phrase, looking for an explanation. She looks almost defiant for a moment, then looks away. He doesn't deserve it. Oh, honey, I laugh. I'm sure he'll be thrilled. They're always thrilled. They even think they deserve it. And then I put on two mittens and carry the pot into the dining room to cover the fact that she needs to be alone. And to give myself time to figure out exactly what it is she's not telling me about this pregnancy. Adrian Burke After Rod finishes showing off his new truck, we head back to the house for dinner. Yeah, he grumbles as we take our seats. From what they're saying on the news, it looks like I got rid of that Technicolor at just the right time. You know what I mean? I shake my head and his wife rolls her eyes. Rodney, she says, this new model is defective. Yours was six years old. Oh well, he pouts. It's the last one I'll have anyway. Sounds to me like this company is finished. Let's talk about something else, Laura says, and for a moment they all seem a little embarrassed. Why? I ask. What's going on? Rod looks at his wife apologetically, chewing, and then says, Oh, I think there's something wrong with the Technics. They've been getting into a bunch of accidents lately. They each find something interesting to say, but not me. Silly. I don't see why that makes it something we can't talk about, I remark. Rod shrugs, but still no one says anything. After a moment, he looks at me with a new gleam in his eyes and says, How about we talk about how much Hawkeye sucks instead? Wait a minute, I warn him. If you want, talk about car accidents all night if you want, but leave the Hawkeyes out of it. We start talking about football while the women look at us bored. Then we move on to other topics and laugh again. It's nice to spend time with people who are still so carefree. It reminds me of what my goal really is and why it's worth fighting for. It reminds me of how happy we used to be. Laura is looking a little down today. As much as she's looking forward to this evening, one would think. I wonder why those looks Melinda keeps throwing at her. Wednesday, May 19th. Adrian Burke. I stumble slightly, catching myself on the coffee table, and tense up as I lower my free weight. It slips out of my sweaty palm about ten inches from the floor and falls to the floor with a clatter. I wrinkle my nose and try to wipe the sweat from my forehead. My hand is just as wet as my forehead, so that doesn't help much. It's a good thing Laura's at work. If she saw what just happened? Never mind. I don't tense up too much. I push myself exactly as much as I need to. Let them think I'm cheap glass if that's what they want to believe. I know better. I'm getting stronger all the time. Standing up and shaking my head to keep the sweat from covering my eyes, I stretch and then head for the shower. A glance in the mirror brings a smile to my face. The stranger is nowhere to be seen. I've gained 15 pounds, my hair has grown back, and the scars on my face don't look so angry anymore. It's a little skewed and still a little gaunt, but it's definitely my face. I look at myself. What a difference two weeks at home has made. I'm sure there's been more improvement in those 14 days than in my last six weeks in the hospital. I even have a job. A cash register at a gas station, but who am I to complain? It'll be nice to have a job again. Besides, it's not too far away. About five blocks from here. So I can walk. I start on Monday. 
It will take me off disability, but I'd rather earn my paycheck, thanks. Besides, Laura's only been back at work three days, and I'm already climbing the wall with boredom. I can't spend the rest of my life as a house husband. No way. Working the cash register is a great start, I think. I'm doing everything I can to prepare. I mean, of course I want to do a good job. But I also don't want to get jumped by a bunch of high schoolers. I practiced counting change for a few hours last night. I'm still pretty slow, but I don't screw up and start over unless I'm under pressure. Laura says it doesn't matter. Most people use debit cards now, not cash. I'd forgotten those even existed. Anyway, I'll get some more practice in tonight. Stepping out of the shower, I examine myself. Somehow I came out of the accident with almost no damage below the shoulder line. Nothing visible, anyway. I reach between my legs, run my fingers down the shaft, and then gently pull it a few times. No reaction. There's one last hurdle left to jump over. On Tuesday, I finally made a doctor's appointment to get a new behavioral medication. Supposedly, this one won't leave me impotent. Heck, I hope it works. With what I'm taking, yeah, my mood is stable and all, but no one and nothing is going to make the little guy stand up. Hardly a worthy compromise, as far as I'm concerned. Hell, the pills don't even work that well, to be honest. True, I have a hard time getting upset, but when I do, holy shit. I almost can't control myself. There was an incident at the hospital that proved it. A week or so after we got home, Laura had to keep me from banging my head against the wall over and over again because I was mad at myself over some little thing. The doctor said it was a result of my trauma, and I guess that's true. I've never been this upset before. Never. Still need to fix the hole in the bedroom wall and the one in the hallway. The phone rings. I rush to answer it. Hi, honey, Laura says tiredly. She's been saying that a lot lately. How was your day? Not bad. I worked out, read part of a book, thought about chores that need to be done. Mostly missed you. Me too. I'm used to being with you all the time. I miss that. Listen. I'm going to have to stay late tonight to catch up. I'll be there no later than 6.30. I promise. Oh. I try not to betray the disappointment in my voice. Good. Don't forget that your mom will be stopping by in a few hours to check on you. Be sure to let her know if you need anything. She doesn't have to do that, Laura. In fact, I wish she didn't. It's just the first week of living on your own, honey. We want to make sure everything's okay. Then she'll go back to Castlewood, and that'll be the end of it. I'm not a baby, I snap. I don't need a babysitter. There's a pause, and I realize she's trying to phrase her answer in a way that will calm me down and prevent another hole in the wall. I know that, she says slowly. We're all worried about you, but only because we love you. No one thinks you're incapable. I take a deep breath, trying to calm the anger. It doesn't work. Okay, I say. Okay. I have to go, honey, she says. Bye. I love you. I shake my head, hanging up the phone. They're not just worried because they love me. I know they do. And I look forward to showing them that they don't have to worry at all. Thursday, May 20th. Amanda Dole. I'm sure I'm hiding the flash of anger and frustration I feel when Adrian tells me that Laura is late for work for the second night in a row. He doesn't seem to notice it. I help him make dinner and clean up afterward make a few phone calls. Then I find a flimsy excuse to stay late until Laura gets home. Adrian doesn't seem worried. Why would he be concerned? He may remember that there were a lot of late nights in the weeks before the accident, but he doesn't remember that it was all a lie. Adrian is in the kitchen counting coins when Laura's headlights flicker on the living room wall. I jump up and run out the front door, waving my arms, trying to get her attention before she opens the garage door. Stopping and rolling down the window, Laura frowns. Mom, is something wrong? Why are you still here? Don't open the garage door. I don't want Adrian to come out here and overhear us. She bites her lip. What's going on? Turn off the car and come out here. 
I'm too old to lean over and whisper. For a moment, her expression tenses, and I almost expect her to open the garage door and leave me standing there. But then, with a sigh, she turns off the engine and climbs out of the car. If it's because I got held up at work, she says, I'm sorry, there's just so much. Don't lie to me, girl. I snap back. Unlike your loving husband, I know all your little secrets. I don't know what the hell you're letting on, but I called your office today and several people assured me that you weren't late. In fact, you left a little early, about three hours ago, so don't lie to me. She stares at me intently, her whole look reminding me of that little girl I caught stealing cookies from the kitchen a quarter century ago. What is it? Mom, I... She licks her lips and makes an indignant expression. What exactly are you accusing me of? You're not stupid, Laura Burke, and neither am I. So stop talking like we're fools. She looks ready to deny it, moves her jaw like she's chewing on something, and then just slumps back against the frame of the car. Okay, she says. Good. I went and talked to Victor tonight, she jerks her head up. But we just talked. I'm not sure what she expected. Hell, I'm not sure what I expected. But we were both caught off guard when my hand flew out and slapped her hard. Of all the stupid, selfish, damned things you can do. I realize my hands are clenched into fists and stretched out in front of me, and I step aside. I almost feel like crying. My daughter is doing this. My daughter. Mommy, she says, already crying. I can't see him. I swear. I had to talk to him about. About the baby. I stop breathing. The baby? What? Grandchild? A beautiful, tiny, chubby, chubby, hand-me-down, innocent creature? And it's Victor. Are you sure? I ask, voice trembling. Mom, look at me. I look, and suddenly I see. We were all so fixated on Adrian that it was right in front of our faces, and we didn't notice. She's gaining weight. She wears loose blouses that hide the bulge, but it doesn't last long. This is also the first time I've seen the deeply retracted bags under her eyes. Oh, baby, I gasp. Oh my God, baby, my grandson. We hug, two crying women. Oh, Bill, why didn't I make you come with me? Finally, I push her away from me. Are you sure it's Victor? She looks at the ground. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. The more I ponder this, the more it upsets me. Will my grandson have that son of a bitch as a father? Will he have his eyes? His tendencies? Will he want to know about it? Did you go to see him tonight? Why? To tell him. I thought he had a right to know. I look at her. The newfound compassion is gone. Had a right to know? Had a right to know? You stupid bitch. What rights does he have in this house? How can you feel obligated to this man? What about Adrian? Have you thought about him? About how this will affect him? Or were you only thinking about yourself again? I'm just... I'm trying to do the right thing. And I've already screwed up so badly. I jabbed a finger in her face. I think you were planning your escape. Matthew. She looks devastated. Damn it, Laura, if you... Hey! A man's voice comes from the front door to the house. What's going on in here? Oh no. Adrian Burke. I thought I heard voices. I didn't expect it to be Amanda and Laura. This family doesn't yell at each other. I wonder what got them so riled up. Stepping out into the darkness and squinting my only good eye, I approach the two women. Laura looks confused and crying. Her mother looks strangely frightened. She must be ashamed that I caught her yelling at her daughter. I only catch Laura's indignant shout and the beginning of Amanda's reaction, but I think I figured out what's wrong. I noticed the look on her face change when I told her that Laura was late at work again today. I didn't say anything, and I probably should have, but there it was. Hi, Laura, I say, keeping my voice cheerful, as if I don't realize I've interrupted her. How was work? Good, she mumbles, letting me hug her. Do me a favor, okay? I ask. Go inside. I only want to talk to your mom for a minute before she leaves. 
Laura hesitates for just a second, breathing raggedly, and then squeezes me tighter. Okay, she says and leaves. As soon as she steps inside, I turn to Amanda. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I don't need this, I tell her. Really? She blinks, studies me, and very slowly says, Okay. It sounds almost like a question. I know Laura is way behind at work because of me, and I'm really capable of taking care of myself a lot more than any of you realize right now. I don't need anyone to babysit me. I don't need someone to help me cook dinner or do the dishes. I can do it myself. And I don't need you to lecture her for working late. If she stays home a few hours late to make it to work, it will make her life easier. Well, I can give her that, right? I make sure to look her straight in the eye to get my point across. I can't give my wife very many things, Amanda. But what I can give her is a lack of dependency. Let me give her at least that. She looks like she's about to cry. Okay, Adrian. If that's what you want. Okay. We hug. She squeezes me tightly, and I thank her. If, why don't you go say goodbye to your daughter, I suggest, and I'll put the car in the garage. She looks at it. Is that a good idea? I almost laugh. I'm pretty sure I can drive the sedan 25 feet into an empty two-car garage. She smiles and strokes my cheek. You're a good man, Adrian. Then she leaves to say goodbye to Laura. Laura Burke. The rest of the evening passes quickly. I don't think Adrian even notices my frayed nerves. A few hours later, however, we lie in the dark and I can't sleep. A thunderstorm rumbles in the distance, and I find myself replaying the same question over and over in my head. When are you going to tell him? God, I don't know. If I wait a few more days, maybe I won't have to. Maybe he'll figure it out on his own. At least then I won't have to say those words. I'm trying to fantasize a way to make things right. What I do every night. When suddenly Adrian stands up and starts talking, shaking me awake. I didn't even realize he was still awake. When I asked you about talking to the baby, he says, you mentioned that you were working late, right? My body goes cold. He's still putting the pieces together. I'd hoped he was done recovering memories. Uh, yes. We were in the process of reorganizing because of the slow economy, and I was part of that process. He is silent for a long time. He doesn't lie down and look at me. He just sits in the dark, staring at the wall. Finally, he says, I was angry. He says it with confidence and sadness. I was angry and scared. I hold my breath. Why? I don't remember. All I remember is that after we talked, I resented you. And really, really scared. I swallow the urge to sob and say, I don't remember any of that. He shakes his head. You said we agreed to wait to have the baby, but we didn't. You wanted to wait, and that hurt me. Finally, he turns to look at me in the dark. Why did you lie to me about it? I was scared, I say honestly. And I was ashamed. I've been mad at myself for having that conversation ever since I found you in the hospital. The truth is, you were right that the timing was right, and I knew it. But I was busy with work and feeling a little under pressure. If I could do it again, I would go back and be just as excited as I was the first time. I'm ashamed of myself for doing things differently. I guess in a way I've noticed that. You are ashamed of yourself. But why was I so scared? What was I afraid of? My mouth went dry. I imagine, dear husband, that it was at this point that you began to suspect me. I imagine that you left this conversation halfway through to find out that I was sleeping with someone else. I say, maybe you were afraid that I would never be ready to have a baby. Suddenly it hits me. Is this really the moment? Should I tell him I'm pregnant? I can have a little chat about how far I've come, and he still doesn't remember that we haven't slept together. Maybe it's... No, he says. No, it was something else. Something about that conversation scared me. I bite my lip. The moment is gone as quickly as it appeared. I love you, I whisper, because I don't know what else to say. 
I love you too, he replies. Then, after a moment, if you remember anything that might point to the reason for my fear, you'll tell me, won't you? Of course I will. Thank you. He lies down, and I can almost feel him falling asleep. But I wait a little while, just to be safe, before I let a tear fall. Monday, May 24th. Adrian Burke. I check my watch for the 15th time. 11.47, just over four hours left. I breathe deeply, look back at the line of shoppers, and try to focus. Mistakes aren't inevitable. I realize that. But it's important to me that the first day goes well. I don't know why. Maybe because the guy coaching me looks 17 years old. If I'm going to screw up, I'd rather do it myself than under the disinterested gaze of some high school kid working 16 hours a week at a summer part-time job. Or maybe it's just another thing I'm trying to prove to myself. So far, though, everything has been fine. There was one problem this morning, but it had nothing to do with the job itself. It was just a reminder that I have new boundaries that I'm not used to. Some chubby, ruddy-cheeked guy at the department store stopped by to ask for directions sometime after nine. Apparently, he'd come from Florida to visit relatives and got lost. I've lived in the area all my life and recognized the name of the street he was looking for. I even knew it was nearby. But there was no way I could figure out how to get there. Worse, as I tried to concentrate, I suddenly realized that I couldn't remember the name of any street, anywhere. So I just stood there like an idiot with my mouth open and nothing to offer. Thank goodness that guy was found. Where did you say you were headed? He cut in. Crestmore Drive, the fat man replied. Oh, hey, you're almost there. The guy smiled a slight smile. The kind that only young people who haven't had anything terrible happen to them yet have. Just turn right on 50th and you'll see it. It's about, what do you think, Adrian? Maybe four blocks away? I forced myself to smile and squeezed out a weak, oh yeah, and then made a mental note to start relearning all the street names in the neighborhood. Just one more thing I need to do. And eh, I can't believe this guy drove all the way to Des Moines from Florida. How long did it take? And what was he even doing? Florida. Something about... Laura. Laura went to Florida. That's where she was when I went to Castlewood. She went to Florida for work and I was furious. But why? Why did it make me so mad? Could it have something to do with the baby babbling? Is that really the point? And why the hell was everyone lying to me? Oh. Oh my God. Now I remember. Now I remember everything. Laura Burke. I can't go through with it. I don't care what anyone else says, I just can't do it. I have to get out of here and I have to do it right now. If I wait any longer, it'll be too late. Any second now, Adrian is going to walk into this house and... Calm down, honey. We're here for you. Mom says it without emotion, without a smile or a reassuring pat on the back. There is no optimism in her voice. Instead, her vocal cords sound metallically heavy, as if they've been dipped in steel. Her face feels like it's carved out of stone. Dad doesn't look any better. They're here for me. They're here to make sure I get through this. They're here to make sure I don't chicken out. And who can blame them? Isn't that exactly what I want to do? The door opens and Adrian enters the room. Mom and Dad greet him warmly, and I try to smile. The look on his face is suspicious. Why are you all here? He asks. Mom and Dad look at me. I open my mouth, but nothing comes out. Closing my eyes, I try again. Nothing. Oh God, someone please save me from myself. Well, first of all, Dad cuts in. We were wondering how your first day at work went. Adrian doesn't answer. Something doesn't feel right. He studies my father for a moment, then my mother, and then me. I don't know why, but something about the look on his face scares me. Finally, he says, why are you really here? I try to start over, get it over with, but when I try to meet his gaze, I fail. Please let this go well. Please let him be happy. 
Throwing a glance at my mom to find some strength, I immediately tell him. Honey, I've been trying to find a way to say this almost since we got home from the hospital. It's been hard, after everything. I've been so... I just thought that maybe it was better to wait until you had time. To heal. But I'm pregnant. And I... His face hardens, clouds over like a summer storm, and I almost lose my nerve. But pretending, playing my part right, is my only hope now. I know it's going to be hard for us, but I think it's a... a wonderful thing. It's a gift, really. We're going to be parents. And maybe it's just what we need to give us a way forward. Just think about it. Mom jumps up, eyes wide and shrill. You're going to be a daddy. Adrian doesn't say anything back. He just stares at me with the same grim focus. That alien, unrelenting gaze makes me want to throw up. For God's sake, Adrian, say something. But he does, and I immediately want to take it back. And not just a silent wish for him to speak. I want to go back ten minutes, grab my purse and my keys, and get as far away from this place as possible. His two words exhale all the air out of me and replace it with poison. My mindless body, programmed for efficiency, spreads the poison like oxygen throughout my bloodstream until it saturates and destroys everything I am. I remember, he says. My parents exchange nervous glances. Uh, remember what? Dad asks, but we're all sweating by now. Adrian doesn't pay him any attention. He just looks at me and shakes his head. I loved you, he says quietly. I loved you so much. And it didn't even matter. It didn't matter to you at all. Adrian? My voice sounds hoarse, like I've been screaming for hours. What are you talking about? He closes his eyes. I was worried because I felt like you were getting further and further away from me. It was the long hours at work that you told me almost nothing about. There was a lack of intimacy, and you were acting strangely quiet. I worried that our relationship was losing its spark. I worried that you were bored with me. He opens his eyes again and looks up, over my head, squinting with the effort of remembering. We were planning on starting a family this summer. I told you about it in hopes of getting some sort of positive response. I was actually looking for some small sign that you still loved me. His face contorted into a grin, the scars giving her a particularly horrifying look. Imagine how I felt when you brushed off the idea like it was completely unimportant. As if I'd been offered the chance to go see a movie you didn't want to see. His hands clench into fists. He takes a step forward, and I can't help but sigh. My father stands up, opening his mouth to speak, but there's nothing anyone can say. It's too late. But I still loved you, snaps Adrian. I still wanted to be with you for the rest of my life. So when you told me about your little work trip to Florida and made it clear you didn't want me to go with you, I did a little reconnoitering. His chuckle gradually turns into a mask of tragedy and his anger into a manic maelstrom of sadness. And I found out about you and Victor. Oh, he shook his head. I found out everything. But not until four hours after you left on your little trip. I tried to contact you to stop you. I called your cell phone over and over again. But we both knew you weren't going to take my calls. So I did the only thing I could think of. I went to your parents to ask for their help. He shivers. There's a wet light in his eyes, a glassy madness. Too bad I didn't die there. It would have made life easier for all of you. Laura could have finally been with her true love, and you two, he waves his hand toward my parents, would have been spared having to lie to me all those weeks. Everyone could grieve a little, and then go on their merry way. And all I had to do was die. Adrian, wait a minute! yells Dad loudly, louder than I think I've ever heard him. We're as disgusted by Laura's mistake as anyone else, but she's back, and she wants your marriage to work out. No one here is grateful to you for dealing with it. I mean it. Handled it. Adrian laughs. Don't you think I made it through, Bill? I'm a half-blind disaster. And if I'm really, really lucky, I'll spend the rest of my life working at a gas station and earning minimum wage. You're getting stronger and smarter every day, Mom insists. 
and you can still save your marriage. What, by agreeing to raise another man's child? By deciding to live my whole life wondering every time she walks out the door if my wife is off having fun with her boyfriend? He throws out his hand, clenching his fist, and as she leans back, it collides with the wall, leaving a new hole. Why would I do that? The mother shakes her head, trying to ignore the display of violence. This isn't someone else's child, Adrian. It's yours. You're going to be the father, not someone else. This is a bad joke. Stop it! She snapped back. A father is not a donor. A father is someone who reads books and changes diapers and tells stories and makes sure the rules are followed. Not someone who got some tramp pregnant and then left. I wrinkled my nose but didn't argue. Really? Adrian turns and stumbles slightly. He's acting almost drunk. Genetics don't matter? Then how about a compromise? When the baby is born, we give it up for adoption and adopt someone else's unwanted child instead. My father grimaces. Adrian, you're embarrassing. No, I will gladly father, he grins again, and this time even uglier. A child not of my blood, as long as Laura mothers a child not of her blood. Can you do that for me, Laura? Is that an acceptable scenario? I can't speak. I'm terrified. I just shake my head negatively. But why not? If we give it up as soon as the baby is born, then you're not a mother yet, right? A mother is someone who reads books, changes diapers. It's different for women, Mom snaps back. I wonder if she sees the look Dad is giving her. Bullshit! Adrian growls. Bill, you once told me that your grandfather was a violent man. My father was a quiet and gentle man, he says grimly. Was he obsessed with purity? He cared a little more than most. So you're saying it's genetics, not lessons. Adrian sways slightly, looking at each of us in turn and smiling like it's Christmas morning. A father's lessons can last a lifetime. His influence lasts perhaps two. But what stays for a lifetime, what is passed down through inheritance, is this, he clapped himself on the chest. This, he slaps it again. So tell me again why I should want to raise and take care of that son of a bitch's child. My parents look at me, but I'm still silent. I know I have a vacant-eyed stare and I'm breathing hard, but I can't bring myself to act. Finally, Mom says, It's Laura's baby too, Adrian. I know it must mean something. It used to count, he admits. She shakes her head and turns to me as if to say, Well, what can I say to that? You don't have to be an only child, my father says. There can be others. Adrian. I finally manage to say, but when he turns to me again, all I can utter is a weak, desperate please. He growls, snatching the lamp off the wall completely unexpectedly and smashing it against the front door. My father tries to subdue him, and my mother in turn grabs my father's arm to keep him out of harm's way. Adrian turns around sharply, presumably to smash something else, but stumbles over his own feet and ends up falling against the wall. Pressing his hands to his face, he sinks to the floor. My parents look at me for guidance, which seems almost funny. I touch my hand to my stomach and shake my head. Leave him alone, I say. We have no reason to keep hurting him. Adrian cries, struggling to get to his feet, and I feel like throwing up on him. I'm leaving he says quietly. I'm leaving tonight. Stumbling, he runs into the bedroom and slams the door shut. I understand, I say after him, and I'm really, really sorry. Adrian Burke. They're talking outside, whispering in curt, urgent tones. I can hear them as I pack my things. Screw them. Screw the three of them. Every one of the, uh, I mean, when they tried to talk to me in the... Damn it. I can't even think straight enough to... Uh... My wife. My wife. There, with some son of a bitch's baby in her belly. God, her belly. It's gotten even bigger. I noticed the weight gain, but... Uh... She was right in my face the whole time. She was just strutting around in front of me, and I was too gullible to notice. 
too stupid to guess. And there it was. The real problem. What a joke I've turned into. They think I am anyway. I know that. But I... Wait, what was I doing? Packing. Right. I have to pack. I have to, uh... That's not my suitcase. It's Laura's travel bag. Damn it, Adrian. Focus. She just took my whole life away from me. How can I focus on anything but this? What am I... His baby in her belly. What am I looking for again? A suitcase? My... Bill Duel. Adrian? Are you okay in there? He doesn't answer me. There are some shuffling sounds coming through the closed door, some heavy breathing, but that's it. I look at Amanda and Laura, who look terrified. I think I am, too. The boy has been in there for 40 minutes without saying a word. I'm going in, I tell him. I'm going to use the hanger to unlock the door, so don't panic, okay? I thought I'd take you to a hotel or something so you can get away and clear your head. Would that work for you? Still no answer. Throwing one last glance at my wife and daughter, I begin to insert the hanger into the handle. Hearing a click, I swing the door open and peek inside. Adrian is hovering over his suitcase, breathing heavily like a long-distance runner. He looks back at me and gives me a surprised look. Hey, I say. Did you hear that I... Oh, he says quietly. Yeah. Don't you think that's normal? Going to a hotel for the night? He blinks, and his mouth moves slowly. Okay. Something's not right here. Do you mind if I check your suitcase? Just to make sure you didn't forget anything? As messed up as his emotions were, the last thing I wanted was for him to forget his medication. I'd heard stories about how head injuries can affect character, but I'd never seen anything like what he'd just set up for us. It felt like another person was with us. Okay, he says almost friendly and steps back. A surreal calm now surrounds him. Opening my suitcase, I flinch and try to think of what to say. How to tell him what I have to do and yet not get upset. Nothing comes to mind. What? He asks, leaning forward, but his voice still sounds detached and strange. Is something wrong? Adrian, I say, what exactly did you pack? Some clothes? Mine? Probably just hers. Why? Look at this and tell me what you see. I wave my hand at the suitcase. He squints at the pile as if trying to make sense of it, like he's looking at something far away, and then he just shakes his head and looks at me. What? he asks. I study his face. His kind eye is glassy, unfocused. The blind eye is red, and the area around it is swollen and puffy. It looks like fresh trauma. His pupils are dilated and he seems... Adrian, I say quickly, did you take your pills? He nods. My evening pills, he smiles. Did you take them from the pill box Laura filled for you? His smile grows wider. No, I made it myself. He makes a surprised face. Isn't that great? I can. The expression on his face dazzles again. He's sweating. He blinks rapidly, opening and closing his mouth without offering any more words. How much did you take? He holds out the pharmacy vial. It's completely empty. My pills, he says. I took my pills. Then he collapses on top of me. Shit. Amanda, I call out. Call 911. Uh Laura runs into the room and holds her arms out to Adrian. But he's too heavy for me to support him, and she's not much help either, so I steer us, falling onto the bed. We land right next to the suitcase he's carefully filled with all the socks he has. Part 3. Tuesday, June 8th. Laura Burke. Good morning, Adrian. I set my coffee down. How did you sleep? He barely glanced at me and yawned, making his way to the kitchen and starting to prepare breakfast. When he raises his hand to grab a bowl of cereal, his shoulder pops loudly, like someone snapping their fingers, and I flinch. He doesn't react to it in any way. He's been practicing so much these past few weeks that I'm sure it's a stress injury. I don't know what he even does besides lifting weights, doing his mental exercises, 
and going to work. And I don't need to hear his joints crunching to realize how heavy those loads are for him. It's enough to look at him, and I can see it. His face has somehow begun to reflect the constant strain without showing any noticeable physical change, like a house that has survived a hurricane or a body dying of internal injuries. His eyebrows are permanently furrowed with creases, like a man who has lost his glasses and can't see without them. Under his eyes are deep pits of bags. The pressure he puts on himself will lead to destruction if he doesn't learn to let his body and mind at least recover a little every now and then. But he's fixated on his goals. He wants to walk away, leave that lying, cheating bitch and move on with his life. And leave his to me. And who can blame him? Do you need me to wash the sheets? I ask. This bed hasn't been cleaned in ages. I can do that. He eats his cereal on his feet, pacing on the linoleum as he chews. But thanks. It's not really a problem. It's my day off, and I'll do the laundry anyway. Let me do it for you. It's okay, Rhea. He suddenly turned and looked at me. Did you and Victor ever... I look away. No, I... We've never... Done that. That's good. He goes back to pacing. I should have asked before I started sleeping there. I try to think of something to say, but all I can come up with is this. He took me in our bed, Adrian. Not in the guest room. The one you've shared with me all these years. And not the one you're sleeping in now. Please, I finally manage. Just let me wash them for you. He stops pacing and finishes chewing the piece in his mouth. Yes. Good. They could use it. Thanks, Laura. Then he goes back to walking and eating. We've been communicating so well lately. I can't imagine what's going on in his head. He hates the fact that I had an affair and that I'm having a baby with Victor. He almost died twice, and I guess he sees my guilt in both cases, too. But that's pretty much all I know. Since he came back from his overdose, he has made no attempt to discuss our situation, and if I even try to broach the subject, he leaves the room. His actions say one thing. He can't wait to get out of here. Even when he eats breakfast, he can't sit down. He has to walk to move. Adrian is desperate to experience forward movement, and eventually he will either reach a point where escape becomes possible, or he will kill himself. Once breakfast is done, he puts the bowl in the dishwasher and heads upstairs for a shower. I may have the day off, but Adrian is working until 8 today. He grabs shifts every chance he gets, working over 40 hours a week. I don't know where the money goes, but it's not going into our account. I'm guessing it's his escape fund. As hard as the numbers and money are for him, I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't just stick it in his sock drawer. I'd be lying if I said I didn't mind. With my income that we live on, our resources are starting to dwindle. He may be on his way out, but for now he eats our food, lives in our house, and contributes nothing to our finances. At this rate, I will be broke by the time the baby is born. If he's going to leave me, does he really need to bankrupt me first? He gets about halfway up the stairs and then stops. Oh, hey, he says. I forgot to tell you. Melinda called last night. She wanted to know if we could come over to her place later in the week. I blink in surprise, not at the suggestion, but at the fact that he relayed it. And what did you tell her? That we'd talk and that you'd call her back. She has the day off today, too. He turns to leave, then hesitates and turns to me again. Do you want to go? I swallow. It's almost a miracle compared to the way I've been treated for the past two weeks. Not just a conversation, but he's asking my opinion on something. What about you? I ask in response. He shrugs. I guess it would be nice to be around friends. Okay. I smile at him. I'd like that too. He nods, then turns and heads upstairs. We'll call a truce, he says. I finish my coffee, decaf because of the baby, and ponder. What was that all about? Is he starting to come to terms with everything? Is his anger subsiding over time? Does the initial shock of realizing that the person you love has failed you get buried under an endless routine until suddenly you are ready to heal again? 
Is it possible that I can still save this marriage? Or is he just making the most of a bad situation until he can't escape? I place my hand on my stomach and close my eyes. Baby, if I can find a way to give you a loving father, I swear I will. No matter how agonizing the struggle, I will endure it. You deserve to have a daddy, and I want you to have everything you deserve. But I can't promise anything. My hopes are just coals on the end of the devil's cigarette. Watch him flick them away. Friday, June 11th. Melinda Blake. Rodney and Adrian are standing in the front yard talking about that truck again. Or I assume they're talking. Rodney tilts his head and says something, and Adrian laughs loudly, throwing his head back and crossing his arms. He's put on weight. I'm glad to see that. I turn away from the window to where Laura is sitting on the couch. She's put on weight too, of course, and she seems to be having a good time. And yet I wonder. Those boys and their toys, I shake my head smiling. I wonder if they ever really grow up, or do they just get quiet enough in their old age to give the impression that they do? I think it's cute, she sips her water. I'm glad to see them so happy. I raise my eyebrows. Adrian's been having mood problems? Her eyes move away from mine. He was upset. Because of you? She blinks. What makes you think that? But her cheeks flush slightly, and I can see her physically fighting the urge to bite her lower lip. Honey, you two have been here for almost two hours, and he hasn't said a word to you. Even when you were bragging about his new job, he only spoke to us and only to add to what you've already said. Maybe I'm missing too much, but it seemed to me like there was a fight between us. She waves her hand dismissively and drinks more water to buy time. Still, when she puts the glass down, the best she can do is say, no, it's okay. Then she goes silent for a while. I fill the empty space with talk about the baby, shopping in general, shopping for furniture, shopping for clothes, shopping for anything. I even offer to go with her to help her spend some money. I'm really just fishing. I'm looking for any sign that my suspicions are correct, that maybe the baby is part of what Adrian is upset about, and Laura confirms them. She lets me talk about it until the men start walking toward the house for dinner. Then she stands up suddenly and says, We still have plenty of time to shop for the baby, she says. I'll worry about all that later. I smile, say, sure, and change the subject. So the mother doesn't want to talk about the baby when the father is around. I wonder why that happens. Laura Burke. Melinda takes the hint and acknowledges it without saying anything. But of course she did. I swear that woman treats every conversation like it's a spy mission. I know she annoys some people with her ambiguous language and gentle prying, but I can see the benefits of that. For one, she tends to be quite perceptive about things and people. She deciphers conversations pretty quickly, picks up on small details that go unspoken, and puts together a clearer picture than another listener might. I wonder what she's learned about Adrian and me? The dinner goes well. At one point, Adrian even turns to look at me and smiles. A miracle of miracles. We're all laughing and talking to each other telling stories and berating the people in our families until Rodney stands up and everything falls apart. He taps his fork on his wine glass with that look on his face, the kind that tells me he has a good joke in store that he can't wait to share. Melinda turns and throws me a look of utter horror that I can't understand. Then she reaches out to grab him, but it's too late and he begins to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, he says in a questionably mocking British accent. Let's talk about making babies. He looks at Melinda's hand, tugging at his sleeve and snickers. I can see that my wife is eager to hear more, but then I should have feared the same. Babies, my good people, are medically tiny versions of very old people. They are usually created by two people, or, in some cases, animals who are very fond of each other, mostly to get their friends to buy them presents. They are also widely known as a way for men to make their male friends miserable by getting their wives to start talking about childbearing as if it were a pleasant experience. But despite all this, I must congratulate my boy Adrian. 
I'm sure it cost him a lot of labor to pass on his unfortunate hair growth line and overly flat feet. We, the people who know you, didn't think you were capable of that. Good job, kid. Sitting back down, he looks around the table and smiles, expecting the usual laughter and barbs that follow his speech. He sees Melinda's annoyance, my own expression of horror, and the dark cloud that we all noticed had descended over Adrian's face, and his smile fades. Did I say something wrong? He asks. Suddenly, Adrian starts laughing. His shoulders shake violently and he grimaces with pleasure. The laughter builds up like a blossoming flower until the volume becomes horribly exaggerated and he almost can't breathe from its force. Not at all, he says at last, wiping a tear from his eye. Not at all. It's just that you left something out of your little speech, Rod. Let me fill it in. Adrian, I plead. Don't. First of all, you congratulated the wrong person. Turns out I didn't get anyone pregnant. Laura's baby won't have my hairline or my legs because I'm not the father. What's more, I haven't passed anything on to anyone yet and may never get that opportunity. Rodney frowns in embarrassment and looks at his wife. Melinda, however, doesn't return his gaze. She looks directly at me, squinting. I can almost see her putting the pieces together. She bites her lower lip and tilts her head, and I can't look at her after that. Instead, I stare at my nearly empty plate. I don't understand, Rodney admits, still stunned. Did you two use a donor or something? Sort of, Adrian chuckled again. While I was in a damn coma and lying in a hospital in Des Moines, Laura was on a cruise ship off the coast of Florida with her boyfriend. It's a real romantic fairy tale. She loved him in high school, but her parents thought he was a bad influence on her. They kept her away from him as best they could, but apparently, true love will find a way out. Classic fairy tale, isn't it? He grins. Actually, as it turns out, the only reason I was in Castlewood at all on the day of the accident was to try to get her parents to help me convince her that she was making a mistake. Well, I learned my lesson. You can't stand in the way of true love. Adrian, snapped I. It's all right, Laura. I had no right to convince you that you were making a mistake. In fact, I got it all wrong. The mistaken question was my own. I should have just walked away and left you alone with your newfound happiness while I could still get away. He sighs. I should have just let you two be together. Who knows? He looks at Melinda and Rod. Maybe they've been dating all along. Maybe I was always just a joke, and now it's time for the jokes to end. Adrian! I yell, slamming my fist on the table and making Melinda jump up. You're not a joke! You never were! And yes, I did make a terrible mistake. But for a few months, not years, I love you. Only you. I failed you, I betrayed you, I cheated on you. But I love you. More than anything. I look up at my master and mistress and see the horror on their faces. I'm sorry, I say, but to no avail. That phrase has become so useless lately. I seem to say it all the time and no one even notices or cares. Might as well be talking about the weather. There's silence for a moment, mocking my apology, and then Rodney asks, What are you going to do, Adrian? Another laugh erupts in response, cold and devoid of humor. What are my options? He asks in response. I can't even take care of myself. Most of the time I manage to do that. But if I'm stressed or excited, all reasoning flies out the window. If I'm angry, forget about it. Let me tell you what happened the night I learned the truth. Laura and her, he snorted. Parents, the people I trusted most in the world, the people who were all the family I wanted to recognize, sat around and tried to convince me that Laura was pregnant with my child. That's how high of an opinion they had of me. But unfortunately for them, Something happened earlier that day that made me remember everything. I remembered the suspicions. I remembered the lies. I remembered the despair. And I remembered how my wife had shut me out of her heart and out of her body week after week. Oh, what faces they had when they realized I knew the lie before they even told it to me. It was pathetic. He takes a deep breath. I decided to leave. Right then and there I was going to end it with them. 
Why put it off, right? I went to the bedroom to pack my suitcase, but I couldn't figure out how to recognize it. And when I finally did, I couldn't figure out what to put in it. I was angrier than I had ever been in my life and completely shut my mind off from myself. I was looking at things and didn't realize what I was seeing. I was stuffing this damn suitcase to the brim with socks and had no idea what I was doing. But it wasn't enough. Then I decided to prove to everyone that I could take care of myself on my own. I decided to take my own medicine. Melinda leaned forward. What happened? I took my medicine. She blinked. Oh. She looks relieved. You're not listening. Adrian smiles, his red eye looking droopy and glassy. I opened the goddamn container and took the medicine. I took all of it. Because my mind was so impaired by stress that I didn't even know what it was. Rodney folds his arms, looking terrified. Jesus, he mutters. Well, Adrian shrugs. What's a little more time in the hospital? But the thing is, when I'm at my best, I can almost cope. As long as it doesn't involve budgeting, stress, difficult problems, emotional situations, or... He shakes his head, his shoulders sagging and his voice growing quieter. What am I supposed to do but stay? Melinda reaches out and places her hand on his arm. There are nursing programs. Of course there are. But how much of my life will I give up before I give up the best of it? How much independence and freedom will you give up before it becomes too much? No. No, I will leave where I am, and I will do it soon. But to do that, I need to go back to a place where I can take care of myself. Melinda nods. If there's anything we can do. I know. Thank you. And I'm sorry for ruining your party. Adrian stands up and yawns. I... Uh, I'll be in the car. There's no rush. It's a nice evening. And he leaves. There's silence for a long moment. I can't decide which is worse, sitting here with my friends knowing what I've done, or being in the car with Adrian's equally silent hatred. Rodney spoke first. I'm sorry that I caused this. I shrug. I know I should be talking, but I barely feel like I'm even alive. He continues. Is there more to the story? He looks at his wife. Adrian certainly has his version of events, but... Melinda throws him a mind-your-own-business look, which he doesn't seem to notice. I think it would be good to know. I shake my head. Most of what he said is completely true. I ran into an old flame. I... I felt something for him. Our relationship with Adrian was starting to fall into a routine, as it usually does, and I loved being with Victor. When I was with him, I felt an excitement that I didn't have in my real life, and I was selfish. I enjoyed being in control of two men. I enjoyed being so important to two different people. So I threw my life away for the sake of selfishness. I knew I was risking hurting Adrian. I just never thought I could hurt him like that. They look at me. Rod looks mortified. I think you should leave, Melinda says softly. I look at her and nod. The preacher's daughter loves intrigue and gossip, but right now she looks like someone who just spent the day hauling bricks up a steep hill for a boss she hates. She might try, but she'll never be able to see me in any other light than this. It will eat away at our friendship until it disappears altogether. Add that to what I've lost. I'm off to find my coat. Adrian Burke I expected Laura to linger and try to put a softer spin on this story. I don't know why. I guess I figured she'd want to defend herself and sympathize with her closest friend. So, I'm lying in the back seat, yawning and trying to get comfortable. But she's already in the car and pulls into the driveway before I can do so. Sit down and buckle up, she says in a lifeless voice. There's no emotion in it. Not resentment. Not defiance. Not loving. Just dead. Oh, yeah, sure. Now that it's over, I'm probably a little ashamed of my outburst. There was no reason to do it. Not here, not in front of people we both consider friends. It didn't accomplish anything. I wish Rod hadn't made that damn speech. 
He said something about gene transfer, and it's like a light bulb went off inside me. I watch Laura behind the wheel, but she doesn't move, except to turn the corner. She doesn't even look back at me in the rearview mirror. Is it silly that I feel the urge to say something to her? Not necessarily an apology, but something that acknowledges that I know I hurt her? I guess it's just the splintered shards of a loving marriage falling all over the place. Yes, she did that to me, but a love that dies easily wasn't love in the first place. It was convenience, or maybe just a determination to be with someone. I don't know. We had love. We really did. So the death throes go on and on and on. I don't say anything because, honestly, what can I say? Halfway home, she breaks the silence. You didn't have to do that. You cost me my only remaining friend today, you know? My parents are ashamed of me, my husband hates me, and people at work get annoyed with me because I can't focus. Now I don't even have Melinda. I'm all alone. She slaps her palm on the steering wheel. I need someone, for God's sake, Adrian. At any other time, I would have asked her about the baby's father. Now I just say, I know. If I could take it all back, I would. She sighed. Why did you do it? Partly because I lost my temper. What other reasons? There's only one other reason, I admitted. But I don't want to talk about it. And I want to, damn it. I want to talk about it. What other reason would make you jump me out there? I look out the window and see a stranger for the first time in weeks. He's watching me intently. Because I'm so sad, I tell them both. She's silent for a while, but I see her wipe her face a few times. Personally, I don't know if I have any tears left in me. Well, she says, if you wanted to hurt me, you did a pretty good job of it. I hope this at least makes you feel good about yourself. I look at the stranger. His face is contorted, angry, and horrified. His mouth is wide open with too many teeth in it. He looks hungry. I blink my eyes a few times, look again, and see only myself. It's not like that, I say. I don't like it at all. She sobs, then takes a few deep breaths, trying to pull herself together. When we get home, she drops into a chair at the table and sits staring at the floor. I walk past her, heading for the bathroom. This night is over. I just want to sleep. You don't have to shut me out all the time, she says. You can... You can leave me when the time comes, but while you're here... I almost don't answer, but then something occurs to me. I stop and turn around. I really have to shut you out, Laura. I'm sorry. It's the only defense I have right now. If I don't, then... Tonight was the result of me trying to find a way to stop keeping you at a distance. The more we're around each other, the worse it's going to get. I start to look away, but then I stop. Look, I say. I'm really sorry for what I did. I'm just... Anyway, I'm sorry. She doesn't say a word. She doesn't even blink. She just stares at the floor and puts her hand on her stomach. After a while, I hear her whisper something to the unborn baby inside. She still sits there when I go to bed. Saturday, June 12th. Laura Burke. The dream is simple but strange. I am back in my old room in my parents' house, the way it was when I was a child. Mom and Dad talk to me as I remember them as a child, even though they look as old as they are now. I respond to them like it's all perfectly normal, but I look my real age, too. My belly is obscenely, monstrously swollen from pregnancy. I am a grown woman sitting on a baby bed and calling it my own, bloated with impending labor. Honey, Mom asks from the doorstep, have you done your homework yet? No, I answer irritably. I'm watching the wind. Oh, she says, throwing me a reproachful look. Just remember to make it before you go to bed. I will. I turn away from her and look out the window. All I see is water. Calm, reflective, peaceful water. This house sits on the ocean, and we need it to go on land. I stare at the horizon, frustrated. Then, in the distance, 
an unusual blur appears in the air. I don't know how else to describe it. The water becomes choppy, the clouds seem to speed up, and a mysterious haze moves swiftly in our direction. I blink my eyes in my sleep and smile. The wind is coming closer. Mom! I shout. Daddy, it's here! The wind! He's here! Good. Father responds from the basement. Now go get Adrian. Quickly. Adrian? I ask. The name is familiar to me, but I can't name him. Who are they asking me to call? And why? Yes! My mom yells, running into the room and shaking me by the shoulders. Adrian! Call Adrian! Hurry or we'll miss the wind! I can't make out what she's saying, and her fingers dig painfully into my shoulders. Why do we need Adrian? Who is he? Mom recoils from me in horror. What do you mean, who is Adrian? She asks, taking small steps backward to increase the distance between us. Then she looks out the window, panic spreading across her face. You have to catch him. Hurry up. He's almost here. I turn to look out the window and feel a jolt in my stomach. I felt the baby, I say. And that's when I wake up. I sit up, breathing heavily, and look at the clock. 6.30. It's so early. Memories of the night before come back to me, unsolicited and frustrating, and I want to scream. I wonder if they have anything to do with that dream. I try to remember what it was about, but the details of the dream are already fading, slipping away from me, so I don't give it too much thought. It's frustrating, but that's about all I can remember. There will be no more sleep. I'm part of the day. I go downstairs to make coffee and eat breakfast. The refrigerator hums, the eggs sizzle, and I almost burn my hand because I'm not paying enough attention. Melinda will be gentle with him. I know she will be. There will still be the occasional phone call, maybe even a few meetings, and for a few more years she will send Christmas cards. She'll complain about how we don't have time to see each other anymore, how nice it is to talk to me again, and then we'll make tentative plans that never materialize. The preacher's daughter was my last friend. What does that say about me? As I turn to grab a glass for my orange juice, I see my cell phone flashing. Curious. Who could have called me between 11 and 6 o'clock? I open it. It's not a call. It's a message. From Victor. Miss you, it says. That's funny. The only person in this world who cares about my absence is someone I wish I'd never met. Is that true? I doubt it. Even now, when I think of him, I can feel my thumb stroking the strings of my heart. We can't control who we fall in love with, or who we lust after. But there is no future for us, not for anyone. This is the first time he's tried to contact me since we met to talk about the baby. I don't know what I expected from that day. I guess I imagined that he would beg me to be a part of his son or daughter's life, beg me to help raise him, and I would turn him down and live the rest of my life with Adrian at my side. What an incredibly stupid girlish fantasy. So stupid. Instead, Victor shocked me by offering to pay for the abortion. And the way he said it, like someone offering to pay for lunch, it took my breath away. For the rest of my life, I will have no trouble imagining the face of the father of my child when he offered to pay for his murder. The way his smile turned into a promise, the way his eyelids drooped slightly, like he was flirting. Sa I drove away immediately and threw up in the parking lot before I got home. Miss you. What a joke. Do I have to respond to something like that? Here I am, all alone. Adrian will never accept this baby and Victor doesn't deserve this. I delete the message and close my phone. Then I eat my breakfast without tasting anything. Monday, June 14th. Adrian Burke. Do you have a minute? Sure, she says. A smile appears at the corners of her lips, but there's a flicker of apprehension in her eyes. It's a very conflicted expression. Why? I think we need to talk about what happens next. Laura's smile fades to nothing, and the conflict turns to simple fear. Oh, okay. 
She turns off the TV and I sit back in my chair. I've been thinking about this conversation and how I want it to be since we had dinner with the Blakes. But now that the time is right, I feel strangely nervous. I lick my lips and begin. First of all, I want you to know that I'm sorry for the way I've been acting these past few weeks. It's taken me a long time to get my emotions under control enough that they don't affect my decision making, and I'll never be done with it. But I don't like it, and I've stopped doing things to hurt you. She nods but looks very sad. I'm sorry too. I raise my hand. I promise to be brief and listen to whatever you have to say afterward. Here comes the harsh truth. I hope she's ready for it. So please understand that I'm not trying to hurt you, but just want to move on with my life when I say it's time for us to talk about divorce. She draws in air like a man who has just resurfaced after nearly drowning, and then lets out a small, almost inaudible moan. No, she says. I'm sorry, Laura. But you should have realized that the ending of this story was a foregone conclusion the moment it began. Even before I knew what you were up to, there was no twist that would have prevented us from being here. I love you, I really do. But there's no happy ending for us. And I want there to be one, someday, with someone. So it's over. She shakes her head. I can't accept that. There has to be something we can do. There has to be some way to get through this. She leans forward. All you have to do is tell me what it is, and I'll do it. I shake my head. Laura, please, Adrian, please, just think for a minute. What do we have to do to save our marriage? What do I have to do to make you want to be with me again? I close my eyes. This isn't how I hoped she'd take it. Laura, I'm moving. I'm going to Chicago and I'm never coming back to Iowa. She looks at me. You're moving? Why? Why are you doing this? What's wrong with Chicago? And what's wrong with Des Moines? I don't remember this place. That's what's wrong with it. My life is shit right now, and I want nothing more than a fresh start. If I can't remember this place, what meaning does it have to me? A bunch of streets? A couple landmarks? What difference does it make? I can't remember their names. But you could learn to. To do that, I'd have to want to learn. My wife betrayed me in this city. She cheated on me and left me. I almost died here twice. The less I remember about Des Moines, the better. She shudders. Chicago, she whispers. When? A little less than two weeks. I saved up some money at a gas station, and Rod's brother said he'd let me crash on his couch until I got a job and a place to live. Oh. Then she squared her shoulders. What if I wanted to move too? What if I wanted to come with you? Outside, the wind blew, making the house groan. You'll have to wait, I tell her. It'll be a few more months before you're ready. She frowns and opens her mouth as if she's about to ask a question. Then her eyes widen, and she puts a hand to her stomach. I'm not giving up my baby, she says. Don't ask me to do that. I'm not asking you to do anything, Laura. Not to give up my baby, not to move to Chicago, not anything. I'm just leaving. So stop asking questions and let me go. Her face folds, and a tear drips down her cheek. I don't want to, she says. I'm sorry this is happening. But it's happening. Another tear falls, and she wipes her face. You're going to be her father, Adrian. You know that. And I don't care what you say. He's an innocent blank slate. If you had only stayed until he was born, you would have seen that. You would have changed your mind. Raising a child is not enough. It's not the same thing, and we've discussed this before. Well, then discuss it again, she snaps back. Because you're wrong. You're wrong, Adrian. A father is someone who cares for a child, who nurtures a child, who reads bedtime stories, goes to parent-teacher conferences and football games. Why can't you be that person? Why? I open my mouth and screw you comes out of me before I can think. Then I throw my hands up in a placating gesture and say, no, wait. If you want to have this conversation again, fine. I've been thinking about it anyway. What if Melinda had done this to Rodney? 
What if she was the one pregnant with another man's baby? She shudders. Melinda would never do that to Rodney. I guess not. She's too devoted to her husband to do what you did to me. But imagine she did it anyway. Okay? Okay. There's a bit of skepticism in her voice. Or maybe nervousness about what I might say. Let's assume that Rod either doesn't know the baby isn't his, or forgives her and stays to help raise it. The labor is difficult, but Melinda pulls through and they have a baby girl. Eight years pass, things are going as well as they can for the little family, and then something terrible happens. Let's say a car accident. We're no strangers to that, are we? Rodney gets in an accident, through no fault of his own, and dies. I wave my hands in the air. Where is he? She frowns. I don't know what you mean. De There's an eight-year-old girl mourning at his funeral, but she doesn't have his eyes, or his nose, or anything else. Whatever it was that made Rodney Blake who he was, it's just gone. And it's not going to continue. And this girl will grow up and remember him as her father. But when she has children of her own, she'll pass on someone else's genes to them. The lessons and stories and adventures they shared will exist as memories, then as stories, and then disappear altogether. Are you saying this girl doesn't deserve to have a father in her life? Of course she deserves one, but why does it become Rodney's responsibility? It's not about responsibility. It's about doing the right thing. Small difference. She shook her head. A bigger difference than I can tell you. Let me turn this the other way. The challenger, Adrian. Just do it. I rise to my feet before I realize what I'm doing. We look at each other, both of us a little shocked. I need to maintain control or I'll do something stupid. Please, one more time, pretend. I sit up. Pretend that the baby in your belly was really mine, okay? Pretend you didn't cut me out of your life right before the accident and I accidentally shot past the goalie. Okay? She nods with a sad look. That would be great. Now imagine I died in an accident. Adrian. Just do it. So, our baby is in your belly and I'm killed. You grieve, you mourn, and then the baby is born. Like you said, it needs a father. So eventually, you remarry. I shake my head. So you see your new husband? this supposedly caring man, as the baby's father? Am I really just a memory? Or do you take comfort in the fact that a part of me continues to live on through my daughter? Hmm. I wait, but she doesn't answer. Tell me, Laura. If it had ended this way instead of the other way, would it matter to you at all that you see me in your daughter's smile or in the way she thinks and speaks? If I died and we had a child together, would you see my face in her frame and find my mannerisms in the way she acts? Or would you just see her as the child of this new person? Who's the father then, Laura? She snorts and lowers her eyes. I... I can't. Tell me. She'll always be your daughter, she admits, like a boxer slamming his face into the mat. Hmm. So DNA does make a difference after all, doesn't it? Laura. If I'm walking to work tomorrow and I get hit by a car, where will you look for me? I look away as she starts to sob. There won't be anywhere to look, and you know it. We can still have kids of our own, she insists. I can't help but snort. You know, you're right there lashing out at me for taking your kid lightly, and you're just as ready to write it off as a mistake as I am. Oh, oh, sorry about the bastard. Let's just surround him with real kids. And then maybe when people look at our pictures on Christmas cards, they won't notice. Disgusting. She lifts her head, eyes burning. That's not what I meant, and you know it. I mean it doesn't have to be our whole family. We can have more. To what end? I may not be good with numbers anymore, but I'm not stupid. Financially, we're doing very poorly, and it's not going to get any better. I'm not going to suddenly start making $40,000 a year again. You're not going to win the lottery. I'm surprised you haven't already talked about selling the house and moving to a smaller one. She averts her gaze and blushes. Oh, and that was pretty soon, wasn't it? She nods. Well, 
Here it is. We're broken. I'm broken. When I get angry or upset, I can barely control myself. Why do you need this for your children, Laura? You can give them something better. She shakes her head, but after a while she says, Then go, Adrian. Just go. That's what you're going to do anyway. Then she gets up and walks back to the bedroom. The door closes. Outside, the wind picks up again, and the house complains about it. You're right, I say. That's what I'm going to do. I was just hoping you'd understand why. Wednesday, June 16th. Adrian Burke. My finger hits the plastic side of the container, and I drop the pill on the counter. Carefully, I pick it up and place it in the pocket labeled Friday. I then carefully double-check each pocket before standing up and looking at Laura. She leans over and quickly inspects all the pockets, then smiles and nods. Perfect again. That's three weeks in a row now. With those words, she turns and heads off to get ready for work. It must be hard for her, validating my success. It's one of the last obstacles to getting out of here. But she has never tried to undermine or fight my development efforts. I don't think she hopes for reconciliation anymore, but perhaps she sees this as a small step toward redemption. So now I can take my own medication. Cross that off the list, Adrian. It feels good. There are some things I just can never get back. My talent for numbers is lost, as is the decoding ability necessary to be anything but a reader educator. I've made some progress, but now I'm more like a high school graduate than a college-educated professional. Emotions, too, will always be a complex and fickle problem. I can learn all sorts of calming techniques, but I can't fully control them. And I doubt I'll ever be able to control my actions when they overwhelm me. It's a strange experience. Like I'm two people. After I do something mindlessly destructive out of anger, I can quite easily step back and look at it as an observer. I can shake my head and realize that what I just did was mean or stupid, and then the next time I get angry, I might just do it again. Whatever attitudes I used to have are gone forever. Because of my light scars and red right eye, a lot of people mistake me for a drug addict, especially when I get tired and start slurring my words. There's nothing you can do about that. But for the first time in months, I think about the future and feel excitement and hope. Congratulations. I turn around. Laura is standing in the doorway, dressed for work. She must have walked back in and I didn't even notice. Too immersed in my own thoughts. Thank you, I say, and smile at her. Then impulsively I ask, can you tell me about it? She blinks. What? About the affair. What? What was wrong with our relationship, Laura? Was there something missing? I just... I guess I hadn't really thought about it, but lately I've been wondering. Laura, to her credit, doesn't shy away from answering. I wasn't happy, she admits. I should have been happy, and I knew it, but I wasn't. A look of grim amusement appears on her face. Ironically, the only thing I want in the whole world right now is to go back to that time and stay there forever. I thought I was miserable then, but... She averts her gaze. Did you love him more than you loved me? I don't even think it was love. I may have enjoyed the carefree excitement of our time together, but I never felt anything that could be called love for him. I shake my head. She looks so tired now. Thanks for telling me, I say. She nods, turns to leave, and hesitates. I really wish you'd stayed, she whispers. I know. Her shoulders slump a little. She nods her head and walks away. Friday, June 27th. Laura Burke, I'm an idiot, doing a stupid dance to a stupid song, and even though I know it, I go on and on. Today Adrian is leaving me. I may never see him again. So what do I do? I run away. I couldn't sit by and watch him pack, and in my sudden overwhelming despair, I ran away. Worse, I called Victor. Can I see you? I asked, my voice strangely calm. It seemed to be coming from somewhere else, like a ventriloquist's. Sure, he replied with a cheerful look. Come over. 
When I arrived at his house, he greeted me warmly. No questions about the baby. Although he seemed eager to get romantic again. I don't think his stomach's bothering him. But it sure as hell bothers me. When I tried to talk about the future, about what might happen next, he pulled away. That's when I noticed the pictures on the counter. New ones of him and some woman. They were pressed against each other, skin to skin, smiling stretched white smiles as light as air. When I asked about them, he seemed relieved and said he'd been dating her for months. I pointed out that he had texted me just 15 days ago to tell me how much he missed me, and he just laughed it off. Oh, he smirked, you know, I was drunk. How about just now, when you were being so squishy? Another laugh, another smirk. I couldn't leave fast enough after that. I don't know why I even went. It's not that I want Victor. In fact, the more time passes, the angrier I get at myself for ever wanting him. But after everything that's happened, after the emotional roller coaster of the past few months, the thought of living alone as a single mom scares me more than the thought of being with an asshole like him. And as much as I hated him, when Victor first opened the door to let me in, when his eyes studied my figure, I felt something. Stupid, stupid woman. I guess the truth is, I just don't want Adrian to leave. If he's home when I leave and gone when I get back, it'll look like he's gone to work. Or to the movies. Or to meet a friend. If I have to say, goodbye. It's been a strange couple weeks. Everything about the divorce has been very amicable. Easy, even. And he was in such an incredibly good mood. He was kinder, gentler, and easier to talk to than he had been in recent weeks. It's like some stranger is living in my house. In my house. Yes, I have a house, and with mom and dad's help, I might even be able to keep it. They're going to move to Des Moines to be closer and help with the baby. That's another concession they're going to have to make for me. Mom's fine with it, but dad's always hated the city. Considering how brutal the last few months have been and how miserable the time with him has been, you'd think losing Adrian wouldn't bother me so much. Since the accident, there had always been some sort of barrier between us. My infidelity, his injuries, my secrets, his discoveries, our shared anger. I can barely remember what our marriage was like when things were good. But for some reason, I still want to keep it. It's like I'm losing something important, something essential, but I can't figure out what. Turning onto our street, I see that he and Rodney are still loading the truck. It looks like they're nearing completion. Shit. I really didn't want to see that. I pull over to the curb, about a block down the road. All right. I'll watch you drive away, but you won't make me say goodbye. Settling in to wait, I turn on the radio. My station is playing some awfully happy song about how beautiful Friday night is, but I'm not inclined to agree with that right now, so I scan the dial. Past hard rock with a whiny singer and hip-hop, I stop on a strange singer with gravel in his voice. I turn up the volume. What's that? He sounds like he's rinsing razor blades and healing whiskey cuts. The music underneath is soft and melancholy, but seems almost amateurish. It doesn't suit my tastes at all. I guess I like beautiful voices and simple lyrics. A year ago, I might have liked this song Friday. But now something about it is mesmerizing. At first, I struggle to make out the words, but as the music picks up and the singer starts to almost howl, it becomes a little clearer. I turn up the volume even louder as he moves on to the next line and try to focus on the words. You can't steer the ship with your faith, he cries his open throat howls sounding just like my broken heart. And the wind still carries me far from the mast. But if you grab the rail now, you'll be safe. As long as I'm here, you'll be safe. Huh? He's her sail. The man in the song is her sail. Something is coming at me. Something from my dream. Something I so quickly forgot. It's my mother, shaking me by the shoulders, telling me to get Adrian before it's too late before we lose the wind. And then I suddenly realize what I'm losing. I'm in tears, honestly. But I can't help the slight mist as I mentally repeat those words and watch Adrian climb into the cab of the pickup truck. 
The engine starts, and the brake lights glow red. I see him fasten his seatbelt. I'm lost at sea. And I have been for a long time. I just didn't know it. I became lethargic, aimless, and made bad decisions. But somewhere in the back of my mind, I was terribly lost and scared. And now, maybe the wind is finally picking up, offering to take me home. But it doesn't matter anymore. I'm losing my sail just when I need it most. The end. If you haven't watched the first part of this video, the link will be in the description. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.